We live in a world right now where journalistic integrity and objectivity in journalism as a whole is more questioned than it's ever been before, probably in history. Most people understand that even the most objective sources in modern journalism have some sort of bias. Journalism is done by human beings, and human beings have emotions and implicit biases, and sometimes they don't always think perfectly logically because they're not robots. The problem comes when people take this information and take it a step too far because bias is bound to be in really any journalistic source. The extreme argument that can be made is that, well, everything's biased. I can't believe anything that any newspaper or any news organization is telling me, and therefore I'm going to get my news from, you know, the source I like or the guy on TV that appeals to me or the crazy guy on Facebook because he might be biased, but you know what? So is everybody. So it's all the same. I would caution against this way of thinking and I would say that although there can be bias in almost any journalistic venture, there's still good ways to get an accurate depiction of history and an accurate depiction of whatever event you're trying to analyze. For example, a historian might be studying World War I, and he might be looking at the Battle of the Somme. And obviously this event happened 100 years ago, so it's going to be difficult to piece together perfectly everything that happened. But the historian might look at the soldiers' accounts on the French side, and then he might look at the soldiers' accounts on the German side, and then he might look at the soldiers' accounts from the British side. And even though every person has their own bias and their own accounts of what happened at the battle, when you start corroborating and seeing what lines up with what and what seems to be being mentioned a lot or what seems to be an outlier, you can start to piece together a picture of the battle and what happened. Furthermore, you can continue to zoom in or you can continue to zoom out and you can start looking at what the politicians were doing during the battle and what civilians were doing during the battle and what other different groups were doing during the battle. And you can start to develop a historically accurate version of what happened at the battle. But it will never be perfect. It'll never be 100% objective. But despite that, it can still be good history that allows us to learn about the past. It is interesting to think about questions like this where you have questions about historical accuracy and journalistic integrity and the standards that a news media organization holds itself or doesn't hold itself to, and to start thinking about whether or not these standards of journalism, standards of reporting, have changed over time, and if they change from situation to situation. For example, What does a free and independent press mean in a war zone? Do the standards of journalism, those standards of objectivity we talked about, do they change when you're literally at ground zero of a war? What's more important, journalistic integrity or survival? A newspaper known as Oslo Bajenia in Sarajevo that was one of the few newspapers publishing regularly during the Bosnian War provides a good avenue from which to start thinking about questions like this. The newspaper known as Oslo Bajenja, which roughly translates to liberation, was founded in 1943 which of course was during the heat of World War II, during the middle of the fighting. And this liberation paper was actually an organ of the communist partisan movement. So if you remember back to the first episode of the series, there was this basically civil war during World War II between the communist partisans, the Serb Chetnik nationalist group, and Croats who were kind of allied with the Nazis. 
And so Oslo Bajenia became this newspaper for the partisan movement. And as it continued in the decades under communist rule, it was essentially an organ of the Communist Party. But towards the late 1980s, as communism was falling apart in Yugoslavia, Oslo Bajenia took a much more democratic approach. As a whole, the paper started going a little bit against what the communist media wanted them to do. And once Yugoslavia fell apart and Bosnia began advocating for independence, the newspaper fully shrugged off its communist origins and became a newspaper dedicated to a more democratic approach. And they maintained their distaste for nationalist approaches. The paper was reporting and doing stories on issues that more or less supported a pluralistic, democratic, multi-ethnic, multi-religious style of country, which we would be familiar with in modern times, but the people of Yugoslavia may not have been so familiar at the time. What made Oslo Bajenia unique as Bosnia was falling apart and being torn apart by war was that the Serb nationalist side of the fight hated the newspaper. The reason they hated it was because the newspaper itself represented everything that was the opposite of what the Serb nationalists wanted. Oslo Bajenia had Serb reporters, they had Croat reporters, they had Muslim reporters. They were advocating in their commentaries and in their editorials for an independent, united, and multi-ethnic Bosnia, which of course is what the Bosnian Serbs were fighting against. As a result, Bosnian Serb heavy guns and artillery very early on in the war targeted the offices of the newspaper and destroyed them. Amazingly, the staff of the newspaper continued producing a paper virtually every day throughout the Bosnian War, and they produced that paper in what was essentially an underground bunker. They found whatever paper they could print on. At times, they had to essentially begged the UN for paper and for gas to power their generators, but they figured out a way to survive and they figured out a way to publish the paper, which was an impressive feat in the middle of a war zone. Author Tom Jelton talks about the importance that the paper took on in the city of Sarajevo, given the conditions. Quote, When newspaper stocks ran out, Oslo Bajenia was printed on paper meant for advertising flyers or packaging. It shrank from 24 broadsheet pages to eight tabloid pages, two or three of which were taken up by death notices. And the press run fell from 60,000 to 3,500, but the paper kept coming out. Under war conditions, Oslo Bajenia took on an importance in Sarajevo that newspapers rarely know. It provided information in a city starved for it, and it survived as a relic of pre-war life in a city desperate to remember normal times. End quote. While the paper meant a lot to the people of Sarajevo, that came at a heavy price. Like I said, their building was totally destroyed by Serb shells. One of their journalists was killed because he worked at Oslo Bajenia, targeted for that reason. There were times where these people literally had to work while pitched battles were taking place in their building. That was actually one of the few days where the paper was not published. At one point during that battle, it looked as if the Bosnian Serb army might overrun the Oslo Bajenia offices, and the people of the paper had no choice but to survive of their own accord. They used trucks to block entrances into the building. They put stacks of wet newspapers in entrances as a way to barricade themselves in. They booby-trapped hallways, and eventually that crisis subsided, but The point is that working at that newspaper and working towards the goal of a free press in a pluralistic society was dangerous. Literally, these people feared for their lives every day. This brings us to what was one of the biggest conflicts for the newspaper and internally what the newspaper debated about amongst themselves quite a bit. There's something in philosophy that's known as the tolerance paradox. The basic idea behind the tolerance paradox is that 
if you want to live in a tolerant society, you have to be tolerant of everybody else's ideas. Even ideas that could be dangerous or threatening, you don't want to silence. You allow those ideas to speak for themselves and then hopefully more and better ideas come out on the other side and most people will choose them, hopefully. The paradox comes when a violent or dangerous idea will continue to be tolerated until it's too late and all of that tolerance gets destroyed by the intolerant. The idea is that if you're always tolerant, what you might be doing is simply planting fertile ground for intolerant ideas to eventually come and destroy you. Another way of phrasing it is, in order to maintain tolerance, you have to be intolerant to intolerance. The question for the Oslo Bajenia editors and reporters was, how do you be objective in this crazy war zone scenario that you're in? You want to present all sides of the story. You want to have journalistic objectivity, but There's also a danger of providing exposure or a platform for Serb nationalist ideas that are literally trying to destroy you if you're not careful. Some people at the paper wanted to simply report everything that came across their desk, regardless of whether or not it would feed into Serb nationalist propaganda. And other people at the paper said, wait a second, maybe we should be a little bit more selective with which stories we end up running because we don't want to give ammunition and fodder for the people that are trying to kill us. And believe it or not, the opposite could be true too. There were Serb reporters at the newspaper who were very hesitant to report on some of the atrocities and murders that were happening while these villages in East Bosnia were being overrun. They felt as if they were Serb and it was just difficult for them to do reporting on fellow Serbs who were committing horrible acts. One reporter talks about her experience after walking through a Croatian village that had been destroyed and burned with a dog tied to a post dying of thirst. She said, quote, I didn't want the story in Oslo Bajenja. I knew what should have been written, and if it had been a Serb village burned by the Croats, I would have done it. I could have written two pages on that dog alone, but because it was Serbs who did it, I couldn't, end quote. The newspaper had to deal with situations like this all the time, where you might have a reporter or editor who has some sort of family connection to an ethnic group or a certain area, and you might have to send them elsewhere to report on something else because... They just psychologically can't do it. One Oslo Bajenja reporter stood up for what he thought needed to be reported, and he refused to back down and compromise his journalistic integrity. He was there in East Bosnia early in the war when a Bosnian Serb criminal named Arkan was roaming from village to village, committing atrocities, murdering Muslims, burning villages to the ground essentially single-handedly with his militia going on a looting, murderous rampage across, in this case, northeast Bosnia, executing people on the spot, causing refugee crisis after refugee crisis. Thousands were fleeing from his wrath. And this reporter from Oslo Bajenja, his name was Smajlovic, was reporting on what was happening. Author Tom Jelton picks up the story from there, quote, On Wednesday night, the outgunned Muslim defenders battled at their flimsy street barricades on the edge of town against local Serb militants backed by Arkan's militia. Early the next morning, Smajlovic phoned the Oslo Bajenja office in Tuzla with the latest news. This will be my last report, he told his colleagues, saying he planned to go into hiding. Within hours, Arkan's Tigers and other Serb militia units had captured this Vornik police station and moved through the town killing as they went. Thousands of Muslim residents fled in panic, most seeking refuge in an old Turkish fortress on a nearby hilltop. Smajlovic was not among them. Two Serb militiamen found him at the Oslo Bajenja office and shot him dead on the spot. A woman selling cigarettes at the kiosk in front of the office building saw the men drag Smajlovic's body out the front door by the feet 
and toss it in the back of a truck, end quote. This is what it means to be a free press during a time of war and in a war zone. Should you report on things that could end up getting you killed or getting your newspaper shut down? Do you give time to perspectives that are clearly dangerous? Do you offer opinions or condemnations when atrocities go down? Or do you strictly stick to the facts and report everything in a dry manner? People at the paper were hesitant to go the route of strictly just reporting facts and offering nothing but dry nouns and verbs because the problem for them was that the other side was not going to be as objective. It was their version of the tolerance paradox. So the reporters and the editors at Oslo Bajania did their best to report on the events of the war as they were happening, do their best to maintain a standard of objectivity, but also at the same time not unnecessarily giving ammunition and propaganda fodder to serve nationalists. In some ways, the main function of the paper was simply to report on the tragedies that were going down in Sarajevo and remember the dead and hopefully give them a chance to have some dignity on their way out of this world. An example of this comes from a reporter by the name of Vlado Merkic, who was a Serb who was working at the newspaper. And like all reporters, he witnessed horrible things. He was shot at multiple times. One of his jackets actually had bullet holes in it. Here's an example of one particularly sad story that he wrote based on what he saw in Sarajevo. Quote, Just as I stopped in front of the old parade ground, there was a terrifying explosion behind me. Ten meters back, I could see a cloud of smoke and dust. A man carrying a young girl in his arms ran up. He was distraught and kept crying. My child is wounded. My child. The girl was unconscious. Behind the man was a trail of blood. We sat them down on the front seat. I moved a hundred copies of Oslo Bajenia out of the car and saw them blow away down the street. Everything that happened during the journey to the hospital passed as if in a dream. The girl, wounded in the back of the head, was unconscious. I didn't dare look at her. I could see a little arm swinging and hair sticky with blood clinging to a forehead. The man who was holding her never stopped speaking. Faster, faster, friend. My child is still alive. A little while afterwards, again. She's warm. She's still warm, friend. Then, my God, she's getting cold. My child is getting cold. In the hospital corridor, the man who had carried the girl took off his shirt, which was soaked with blood. Together we went into the toilets to wash our hands. He told me the girl was called Sinella. Her father will lose his mind when he hears, he said. She's not your daughter, I asked. No, but she was my favorite child on the block. Aren't all these children ours? We went back to the old parade ground. There was blood everywhere under our feet, on the doors of the car. At the place where we had helped the wounded, there were still large pools of blood on the ground. I gathered up the newspapers and took them downtown to a vendor. The next day, he said, I didn't sell any of them. No one wanted to buy newspapers stained with blood. End quote. Poignant stories like that, written by Serbs about the plight of Muslims in Sarajevo, were important for the newspaper to promote because it showed that there wasn't as much of this inter-ethnic tension as the Bosnian-Serb side of the conflict tried to make it seem. And it also brings us to another tough question that the newspaper had to deal with, and the question is, how much do you focus on the plight of the Serbs that were living in Sarajevo? Remember, tens of thousands of Serb people decided to stick it out and remain home rather than going over to the Bosnian Serb side. The question for the paper became when some of these Serbs fell victim to abuse or had their apartment stolen or, in the worst cases, were murdered by criminals. Again, this was never sanctioned by the Bosnian government, but on a smaller scale than what was going on on the other side, this kind of stuff was happening a little bit. 
as a paper, how much do you focus on the plight of the Serbs in Sarajevo that were on the receiving end of that abuse? There could be a danger of overplaying that and allowing Serb national extremists to get a hold of it and use it for nefarious propaganda purposes. And as a result, sometimes the Oslo Bajenia paper decided to kill stories like this rather than report on them, feeling that they could potentially be insensitive to a majority of Muslims who were suffering in Sarajevo and in rural Bosnia. It is important to know that these decisions were not uncontroversial. So there was heavy debating and there was a staff that fought consistently all the time about decisions like this, and there were people on both sides of the debate arguing vigorously. You have to remember that this is a newspaper that has only been operating as an independent and, you know, Western-style journalistic unit for a couple of years. They are still developing their journalistic standards. They're still trying to raise them. They've had members of their staff be murdered. Their offices have been destroyed. Most of the employees either know family members or friends who have been killed as a result of what's going on in this war. And they're trying to publish a newspaper in a war zone. So even if you think that, you know what, the journalistic standard should be the truth. Whatever happens, it should be reported. To heck with the tolerance paradox. Even if you think that, and you might be right, you hopefully begin to understand some of the questions that these people at this newspaper had to tackle while they were trying to struggle to survive and fight for their lives. And even if you don't agree with the decisions they made, you can begin to understand why, as a paper, they made them. Another good example of this is that while there was only one side of the conflict that intentionally and repeatedly targeted civilians and committed state-sanctioned ethnic cleansing, there were villains on both sides of the conflict. For example, in Sarajevo, during the siege, a black market and smuggling became a huge development. Certain Bosnian soldiers controlled the ins and outs into the city areas that could make big profits for them if they controlled the flow of goods and services. A criminal underclass began emerging in Sarajevo, which threatened to taint the reputation of the city. As I mentioned earlier, rogue commanders were going around looting and committing crimes, and eventually these guys were arrested, but not before the damage was done to the reputation of the city. There was a very unpopular dig for victory campaign that the Bosnian soldiers forced civilians to be a part of, which basically meant that at any moment you could be pulled off the street at gunpoint and forced to go dig trenches on the front line. You couldn't alert your family and friends. Very rarely could you get word to them, so oftentimes they would think you're dead while you're out there digging trenches. So again, stuff like this muddies the moral waters a little bit. The reality is, as we've pointed out, the Bosnian Serb side was much more at fault for the horrible things that happened during this war, but the reality is both sides had villains. And as always, it's the common people who got hurt the most. So one criticism of Oslo Bajenia was they didn't report much on this situation with the dig for victory stuff and with the rogue militia commanders doing things that are immoral. One reason they didn't report much is there was a real fear of retaliation, much like the reporter who was killed. With some of these paramilitary types, if you reported bad things on them, he was known to shoot up media centers or newspapers before, so it wasn't out of the question. Even so, many criticized the paper for having too much commentary, not enough quote-unquote straight news, and again, the paper had to self-reflect and think about questions like this. Should they have a sort of reporting free-for-all where sort of in the Western style, anybody can report what they want and publish it without too much oversight? Or should they have some of the more cable newsy modern approach where there's a political and editorial line that directs everything that's going to get said and also what doesn't get said? And all the stories are kind of filtered through that 
political or editorial lens. But given the conditions and the fact that this was a war zone, you have to give credit to what Oslo Bajenia did during this time. There was some solid and honest reporting, even when it made Bosnia as a country look bad or the Bosnian government look bad. The paper actually ticked off all sides. So they upset the Serb nationalists, but they also upset the Bosnian government and Muslims when they did report on some of this stuff uh, that wasn't exactly making Bosnians or the Bosnian government or Muslims look good. Just as an example, the UN and the Bosnian government played a big role in providing the Oslo Bajenia newspaper with supplies, paper, gas to fuel their printers, things of that nature. So it was actually dangerous to criticize that side of the conflict, just like it was dangerous to criticize the Bosnian Serb part of the conflict because you were fearful for your life. But the Oslo Bajenia newspaper did criticize its own government at times when it was called for. They did it anyway. And at times upset the government and the UN. It's typically a good sign, some people might say, when you're taking off all different sides of a conflict. The main editors at Oslo Bajenia probably put survival and existence of the paper as their number one priority ahead of journalistic standards. But that doesn't mean they didn't have them, and that doesn't mean that those two things couldn't work together. For some, the principle of what Bosnia stood for, not in a sense of nationalism, not in a sense of ethnicity, not in a sense of religion, but in a sense of the principles that Bosnia stood for, those were what they were trying to uphold and that generally showed in the work of the newspaper. The man in charge of Oslo Bajenia, Kemal Kursafic, gave his summary of what he thought the paper represented. Quote, the society advocated in the pages and in the ethnic composition of Oslo Bajenia is a society of human rights and liberties in which each individual is free to believe in what he wants or not to believe, a society in which all religious and ethnic rights and traditions are guaranteed but in company with the centuries-old atmosphere of tolerance and the culture of living together, end quote. The commitment and the perseverance and the grit of the people who worked for Oslo Bajenia during the Bosnian War and during the siege of Sarajevo is something to be commended regardless of the discussion of journalistic objectivity and the tolerance paradox and all that stuff. Author Tom Jelton ends his book, Sarajevo Daily, which is about the Bosnian War and the siege of Sarajevo and the performance of the Oslo Bajenia paper by saying, quote, Sarajevo was the city that exemplified the spirit of pluralism and tolerance that has been the principal casualty of the Bosnian War. If there are moral champions in this story, there are those residents of Sarajevo who kept on defending their civic values even when the world was indifferent to their struggle. No group was truer to that cause than the people of Oslo Bajenia, who 30 terrible months after the onset of siege were still publishing their newspaper every day and showing that right-minded Serbs, Muslims, and Croats could work together no matter the assault on their communities.